subscribe to learn cap and hit the bell icon to get notified today my dear friends we will discuss equalization levy okay yes before discussing equalization levy you have to know some of the backgrounds of equalization levy for new business models that rely more on the digital and telecommunication network do not require a physical place to conduct their business so it is like a fully technology oriented business does not require a proper physical presence to do or conduct their business and to generate income so these kinds of things or these kinds of technology driven businesses may cause some of the tax challenges what all are the tax challenges let's say taxing jurisdiction where a particular income should be taxed because there is no physical presence so what is the taxing jurisdiction then the difficulty of locating the transaction identifying the taxpayer physical presence based permanent establishment for example permanent establishment we have already discussed what is PE in our previous slide. So, for PE, what do you mean by PE? That is a fixed place of business. There should be a continuous fixed place of business for establishing permanent establishment or PE. So, the factor is technology driven businesses does not have a proper physical presence. They are totally based on their technological advancements. So, this is also a bigger trouble. The OECD recommendations under action plan one of BEPS project to tackle the direct tax challenges includes the following Organization for Economic Corporation and Development OECD has given recommendations in their base erosion profit shifting plan one let's see what all are the recommendations modifying the existing definition of the permanent establishment to provide for whether an enterprise engaged in fully dematerialized digital activities would constitute a PE so it is maintained a significant digital presence in another country's economy. So, what BEPS states about, they are actually deviating from the conventional permanent establishment concept. That means a physical presence to digital presence in another country. That is what BEPS action plan states about. Moving forward, they introduce the concept of virtual fixed place of business rather than actual fixed place of business rather than the actual permanent establishment concept they have changed into virtual fixed place of business this is totally for technology oriented business because they don't have as, as I earlier said they don't have a proper physical presence in any country so to tackle that kind of a situation they are bringing in virtual fixed place of business so the imposition of withholding tax on gross basis in case of a certain payments made for digital goods or service provided by a foreign e-commerce provider or imposition of an equalization levy on consideration for certain digital transactions received by non-resident from a resident or from a non-resident having permanent establishment in another contracting state. This is so confusing, right? Let's see what it is. This is actually called equalization levy. Equalization levy is actually introduced in chapter 8 in the Finance Act 2016. It is not as a part of the Income Tax Act. It is introduced in Finance Act 2016. Let's see what is equalization levy. So equalization levy is at 6% is leviable on the amount of consideration for specified services received or receivable by a person being a non-resident. Okay, suppose, so who is the recipient? Recipient is always, should be, recipient should always be a non-resident. Non-resident and the payer is a person resident in India and carrying on business or profession. Okay, so the payer is a resident or a non-resident having permanent establishment in India. So, you have to notice these two points. Who is the payer? He should be a taxable SSC. We can say it as a taxable SSC, right? What, what it is? A person resident in India carrying on business or profession or a non-resident having a permanent establishment. That permanent establishment or the profits attributable to that particular permanent establishment obviously be taxable as per the domestic taxation. That's why I said a taxable SSC. Okay. And a taxable SSC, if he pays certain consideration to a non-resident for specified services, then 
it is subjected to equalization levy equalization levy is on the amount of consideration payable equalization levy is charged on the amount of consideration payable for specified services which is actually received by a non-resident from a taxable SSE okay now let's see what all are the specified services specified services means an online advertisement any provision for a digital advertising space or any other facility or service for the purpose of online advertisement or any other service as may be notified by central government you can see these two services does not require a physical presence so the objective of equalization levy is to tackle those kinds of businesses which does not require a physical presence in any country so it is like the services like an online advertisement we can easily operate it through the internet we don't have to have a proper physical presence in any country to carry on an online advertisement services or any provision for a digital advertising space or any other facility or service for the purpose of online advertisement any auxiliary services to the online advertisement so let me explain it once more equalization levy means specified services suppose a non-resident person a person from France is carrying on or a non-resident I'm not saying a person from France a non-resident person doing a advertisement service to a particular resident okay then that resident at the time of paying the consideration to the non-resident have to deduct liquidization levy at six percentage on the consideration this is what I'm trying to say okay let's see equalization levy is not chargeable where there are certain exceptions to equalization levy before that I'm, I'll explain it once more the payer the receiver for example a non-resident does a service that is providing advertisement suppose he is an advertiser a non-resident is providing the services relation to advertisement to a resident to a resident and he pays consideration for the services done by the non-resident now the question is in order to tax the income of this particular non-resident what is the condition there should be a PE in India if the if Indian government or CBDT wants to tax this particular non-resident in India then this particular non-resident should have a PE in India that means a permanent establishment in India okay being this person is a technology driven businessman he does not have a proper physical presence in any country suppose he's completely online advertisement he's completely operating through internet you don't have a proper physical office in any country okay so there will be confusion where this person should be taxed where to be taxed and what is the income all those things will come in so in order to tackle such situation the concept of equalization levy has been introduced what the finance act 2016 states if the resident is actually paying or if a resident or a non-resident having a PE in India if the payer is any of this person then at the time of payment itself he have to deduct six percentage levy on the consideration amount this is what equalization levy states about okay that is six percentage on the consideration for specified services which is received by a non-resident from a person who is a resident in India carrying on a business appropriation or a non-resident having a PE in India let's see there are as I said earlier there are certain exceptions to the equalization levy as well let's discuss all those exceptions equalization levy is not chargeable where the non-resident providing the specified service has a PE in India and the specified service is effectively connected with such PE so what the one se what section 165 states about us if that particular non-resident does have a PE in India then no equalization levy is very logical right if that particular person have a PE in India then why equalization levy he can go for the normal tax provisions because PE is the one and only requirement for taxing that particular income attributable to the PE 
and if that person if that non resident have a p in india then obviously it will be taxable so we don't have to check or we don't have to levy that 6 percentage we can charge him much more right or if it's a company we can charge him 40 if it's a non resident individual we can charge him 30 we don't have to go for this 6 percent again moving forward if the aggregate amount of consideration for specified service received or receivable in a previous year by that non resident from a person resident in india and carrying on or business any any business or profession or from a non resident having p in india does not exceed 1 lakh and what it says the if the aggregate consideration payable by resident or person having pe in india does not exceed 1 lakh then no equalization levy this is actually a benefit given to the small payers or small entities okay what it says if the aggregate consideration payable to a particular non resident by a resident or a person having pe in india then he does not if the aggregate amount does not exceed 1 lakh then no provision or no traction of equalization levy that is what section 165 states about again where the payment for the specified service by the person resident in india or having a pe in india is not for the purpose of carrying out business or profession again the payer is actually utilizing suppose for example the payer is not utilizing the online advertisement services for his business or profession he is actually utilizing it for some personal purposes then no question of pe sorry no question of equalization levy this is what it states where the payment for the specified service by the person resident in india or the pe in india is not for the purpose of carrying out any business or profession then no equalization levy actually there are three exceptions exception number 1 if the person receiving the non resident person receiving the income or receiving the consideration have a pe in india then no equalization levy very logical point number 2 the aggregate amount of consideration for specified service receivable in a previous year by the non resident does not exceed 1 lakh then again no equalization levy point number 3 if the person utilizing the service is not or uh, the person actually is not utilizing that service for his business or profession then again no equalization levy these are the three things moving forward section 166 of the finance act 2016 that states about the collection and recovery of equalization levy how the equalization levy should be collected or how it should be recovered this is what section 166 of the finance act 2016 states about let's see every person being a resident and carrying on business or profession or a non resident having a permanent establishment in india this thing is already a repetition in india shall deduct equalization levy from the amount paid or payable to a non resident in respect of specified services it is just like tds at the time of payment we have to deduct that 6 percentage from the consideration amount and we have to pay it to the credit of the government this is what equalization levy or the collection and recovery of equalization levy takes place okay again and stressing he shall the payer shall deduct equalization levy from the amount paid or payable to a non resident in respect of specified service at the time of payment that's it point number 2 the amount of consideration of specified services equalization levy interest and penalty payable and refund shall be rounded off to the nearest multiple of rupees 10 this is a simple thing what it states is about the amount of equalization levy including interest if any or penalty if any shall be rounded off to the nearest multiple of 10 this is actually very irrelevant but again moving forward the time period of remittance of equalization levy at what time you have already discussed how it should be deducted at the time of payment it have to be deducted from the amount of consideration okay the payer has to deduct the uh, equalization levy from the amount of consideration and at what time it should be paid to the credit of the government that is what here it states it should be paid to the government by 7th of the month immediately following the set calendar month that means 7th of next month is the due date of paying equalization levy to the credit of the government 
we have to deduct it at the time of payment and we have to pay it to the credit of the government before 7th of next month. Yes, it is just like TDS again. Now, any SSE who fails to deduct equalization levy shall notwithstanding such failure be liable to pay the levy to the credit of the central government by 7th of month immediately following the said calendar month. What it states, it says if a person, for example, a resident at the time of paying consideration to a non-resident who does some specified service, that is some advertisement service, at the time of paying consideration, if the non, if the resident fails to deduct equalization levy, then again it is the responsibility of the resident to deduct. Even though if he fails, does not matter. This person will be liable to pay the levy to the credit of central government. That is what this point states about. Why? Because he is a non-resident. He does not have a physical place or a physical place of business. He will escape like that. That's for sure. So, the ultimate responsibility to pay equalization levy is on the resident. That is what this point states about. If the SSE who fails to deduct equalization levy shall notwithstanding such failure be liable to pay the levy to the credit of the central government by the 7th of next month immediately following the set calendar month. Even if he fails, the ultimate responsibility is on this particular person. That's it. Moving forward, furnishing of statement under section 167. Section 167 mandates a statement. Let's see what it is. Every SSE shall, within 30th of June immediately following the financial year, prepare and deliver to the AO, that means the jurisdictional AO, a statement in form number 1, verified in such manner and setting forth such particulars as may be prescribed in respect of all specified services during the financial year. It is just like a return of income. That resident person or a person who has a P in India, at the time of paying the consideration, what he has to do, he has to furnish a statement. And this statement is to be furnished to the AO before 30th of the June from the end of the financial year. That's it. Okay. And that statement should be furnished in form number 1. This is what section 167 of Finance Act 2016 states about. Moving forward, revised statements. Just like our return of income, we or the SSE has the responsibility or has the right to revise the statement. Let's see what it is. The SSE who has not furnished the statement within the aforementioned time or the FOZ time, having furnished such statement, notice any omission or wrong or any other particular therein, may furnish a statement or a revised statement as the case may be at any time before the expiry of two years from the end of the financial year in which the specified service was provided. So, the maximum time frame for filing a particular statement or for revising a particular statement is two years from the expiry of two years from the end of financial year in which the specified service was provided. This is what section states about. Let's see what all are the situations. If the SSE fails to furnish a statement or the furnished statement has some kind of rectification or error, then again the SSE has the right to revise or file a belated statement before the expiry of two years from the end of the financial year in which the specified service was provided. Two years from the uh, from two years from the end of the financial year in which the specified service is provided not the point okay moving forward notice by assessing officer where the SSE fails to furnish the statement within 30th June immediately following the financial year the AO may serve a notice upon such SSE requiring him to furnish the statement in the prescribed form verified in the prescribed manner and setting forth such particulars within 30 days from the date of service of the notice. It is just like sending a notice, that multipurpose notice, 142 subsection 1. It is similar to that. What it states, the assessing officer has the right to serve a notice on a particular assessee if he fails to furnish the statement as required by section 167. This is what this section states about. And if such a notice is served, then that particular assessee has to file the statement within 30 days. That's it. 
okay moving forward processing of statement under section 168 what do you mean by processing it means what all are the things after after filing the statement what all are the processing that is done on that particular statement this is what section 168 states about let's see the statement furnished under section 167 shall be processed in the following manner point number one the equalization levy shall be computed after making the adjustment for any arithmetical error in the statement that means once the statement has been filed the AO will check the arithmetical accuracy of that particular statement that is what it says the equalization levy shall be computed after making the adjustment for any arithmetical error in that particular statement that particular statement just like section 143 subsection 1 summary assessment i hope you remember summary assessment in your normal dt area what it states about it is just checking the accuracy of the return of income filed likewise here we are actually checking the arithmetical accuracy of the statement which is filed okay this is the first processing state the second step is like the interest if any shall be computed on the basis of some deductible as computed in the statement that means if that particular equalization levy has to be credit credited to the central government within 7th of next month if there is a delay in paying the equalization levy to the credit of central government then there will be an interest as per section 170 okay that interest amount will be calculated if it is not provided in the statement that's what point number two states about the interest if any shall be computed on the basis of some deductible as computed in the statement point number three the sum payable by or amount of refund due to the SSE shall be determined after adjustment of interest against any amount paid under section 166 or 170 and any amount paid otherwise by way of tax or interest what it states what it states is like after computing the equalization levy and after computing the interest the final amount determination that is what point number three states about whether it is payable or whether it is a refund this is after computing the equalization levy and the interest portion thereon moving on to the point number four an intimation shall be prepared or generated and sent to the SSE specifying the sum determined to be payable by or the amount of refund due to him that's it point number one we are actually checking the arithmetical accuracy point number two we are finalizing the interest payment point number three we are finalizing the total equalization levy whether it is payable or a refund point number four an intimation is generated or an intimation is served on to the SSE stating you have to pay this excess amount of equalization levy or we are actually refunding the excess amount paid by you these are the possibilities an intimation shall be prepared and generated and sent to the SSE specifying the sum determined as above whether it is a refund or more amount to be paid this is what the intimation states about point number five the amount of refund due to the SSE shall be granted to him as usual point number one arithmetical accuracy interest final amount intimation stating more equalization levy or I will give you the refund point number five actual payment that's it moving forward however no such intimation shall be sent after the expiry of one year from the end of the financial year in which the statement is furnished once the statement is furnished then the time or the expiry period for file or sending the intimation is one year from the end of the financial year that's it moving forward for the purpose of processing of statement the central sorry the board may make a scheme for centralized processing for such statements to be determined the to determine the tax payable by or a refund due to the SSA it is like CPC centralized processing system that means the government is actually planning for a centralized scheme of operations rather than human interventions they are actually planning for a completely mechanized scheme of processing that's it moving forward just like 143 one your summary assessment area moving forward where any levy interest or penalty is payable under the equalization levy provisions and notice of demand in form number two specifying the sum so payable shall be served upon the taxpayer so after the processing if any amount is payable by the SSC to the to the department then there shall be 
a notice of demand in form number 2 specifying the amount so payable. That means the assessee shall be served with a notice of demand. It is just like section 156 notice of demand after regular assessment or reassessment. It is similar to that. If there is more equalization levy to be payable, then a notice of demand has to be served by the AO to the SSE stating the amount so payable. That's it. For moving forward to the next point. Further, intimation issued upon processing of the statement of specified services shall also be deemed to be a notice of demand. What is this point? already CPC generated that means you have to pay these and these amount that is the CPC intimation already in that intimation I have specifically mentioned the amount of equalization additional equalization levy payable then I don't have to issue another what another notice of demand again for stating to pay the amount you got my point it is just like once 143 one intimation has been sent then there is no requirement of 156 hope you remember in the assessment procedure area just like that once if notice of demand or once if the intimation clearly states about additional equalization levy payable then again no need to issue a notice of demand that's it okay moving forward 169 rectification of mistake with a view to rectifying any mistake apparent from the record Again, rectifying any mistake apparent from the record, the AO may amend any intimation issued under section 168. What do you mean by mistake apparent from the record? If there is any error, if there is any point which should have been considered by the AO, which is not actually considered, if there is a mistake, then what is the solution? A rectification of mistake is possible under section 169 of Finance Act 2016. That's it. With a view to rectifying any mistake apparent from the record. If there is a mistake, it can be rectified. Or there is no change of opinion based on merits is possible. If there is a mistake, obviously we can change or we can correct that particular mistake area. That's it. Such intimation can be amended within one year from the end of the financial year in which an intimation sought to be amended was issued. That means what is the time of rectification? Time of rectification or maximum period of rectification should be within one year from the date on which intimation sought to be amended was issued. Suppose the intimation was issue, issued on 1-1-2018. Okay. 1-1-2018. Then the end of the financial year is, is 31-3-2018. Then the maximum period of rectification that means we can rectify if you if you want to rectify this particular intimation issued on 1 1 2018 the maximum time frame is 31 3 2019 that is within one year from the end of the financial year in which the intimation sought to be amended was issued okay the intimation is issued in 1 1 2018 and the end of the financial year is 31 3 2018 the maximum period of rectification is one year from the end of the financial year in which the intimation sought to be amended was passed. That's it. Moving forward. The assessing officer may rectify any intimation either suo moto or on any mistake brought to his notice by the SSE. What is the point? The assessing officer by himself rectify or he can rectify based on an application given by the SSE. That's it. Sio moto means by himself without any application from the SSE or without any move from the SSE. He himself, he suppose, subsequently he himself realized that there is a mistake in the particular intimation sent by the AO that he, he may himself rectify that particular mistake. That's it. He didn't have to wait for the application from the SSE. Moving forward, an amendment to any intimation which has the effect of increasing the liability of SSE or reducing the refund shall not be made unless the assessing officer has given notice to the assessee of his intention to do so and also has given the assessee a reasonable opportunity of being heard. That means if any action which is prejudicial to the assessee is gone take, then an opportunity of being heard should be always served to the assessee. That's it. Again, I'll explain an amendment to any intimation which has the effect of 
increasing the liability of the SSC, which is actually prejudicial because he have to pay more equalization levy or reducing the refund again it is it is prejudicial to the SSC shall not be made unless the AO has given a notice to the SSC of his intention to do so he has to actually serve a notice stating that I have, I have noticed these these things and you have to pay this additional amount that's it and an opportunity of being heard shall be served to the SSC that means what there, there should be SSC should be given with a chance to give a proper explanation that's it moving forward where any such amendment to any intimation has the effect of enhancing the sum payable or reducing the refund already made the assessing officer shall make an order specifying the sum payable by the SSC and the provisions of this chapter shall apply accordingly. If there is an additional amount, then he have to issue an order for recovering that particular amount. That's it. If there is an additional amount or if there is less amount of refund, after an opportunity being of being served, of being heard is served, he have to issue an order. That's it. Moving forward. Interest on delayed payment as I've said earlier section 170 states about the interest on delayed payments Every SSC who fails to credit adequate equalization levy to the account of the central government within the specified time period That means 7th of next month If you didn't credit the equalization levy within 7th of next month then you have to pay simple interest at the rate one percentage per month or part thereof by which such crediting of tax is delayed okay it is just like the tedious provision if you fail to deduct or if you fail to pay to the credit of the government you have to pay simple interest at the rate one percent per month or part thereof that's it section 170 states about again Penalty for failure to deduct or pay equalization levy under section 171. These are the penal provisions. Let's see. Failure to deduct whole or part of equalization levy. Okay. What is the penalty for failing to deduct whole or part of the equalization levy? It is like in addition to the payment of equalization levy and interest, a penalty equal to the amount of equalization levy that uh, equalization levy that he failed to deduct would be leviable that means maximum penalty is 100 percentage of equalization levy this is what section 171 states about if you fail to deduct whole or part of equalization levy then the maximum amount of penalty chargeable is 100 percentage of the equalization levy and this penalty is in addition to the original equalization levy as well as the interest that's it Moving forward, failure to remit equalization levy to the credit of government on or before 7th of the following month after deduction. I have already deducted but I failed to credit it to the government. Then what is the penalty? Let's see. The penalty is 1000 per day. However, it is subjected to maximum limit of equalization levy. That means the penalty is 1000 per day of default and the maximum penalty chargeable is 100 percentage of equalization levy this is what section 171 states about penalty is thousand per day big very big amount okay and the maximum amount of penalty is 100 percentage of equalization levy yes moving forward penalty for failure to furnish statement earlier we have discussed about a statement now we are discussing the penal provisions for failing to file that particular statement that is 172 for failure to furnish the statement within 30th june of the 30th june of the immediately following year or within 30 days from the date of service of notice by the assessing officer the penalty is 100 for each day during which the failure continues what it states normally as we have as we have already discussed every SSC has to file a statement furnishing of this i mean which contains specified services received by that particular person okay this shall be filed with the government or with the authority within 30th of june from the end of the particular financial year this is what the time frame and if a person fails if a person fails to furnish this particular statement within the time frame then the maximum penalty or the penalty is 100 rupees 
per day of default that's what section 172 states about or within 30 days from the date of service of notice we have already discussed AO has the right to send a notice stating you have to furnish your statement you have failed to furnish your statement it is kind of a reminder you have to furnish the statement it is not a mandatory but the AO has the right to send a particular notice stating or or uh, requesting or demanding not requesting demanding the SSE to furnish that particular statement okay and the SSE has to furnish the statement within 30 days of receipt of that particular intimation if he fails to furnish then again 100 per day un uh, until the default is satisfied that's it moving forward circumstances when penalty cannot be imposed under section 171 and section 172 section 171 states about the penalty for failure to remit equalization levy and section 172 states about penalty for failure to furnish the statement which is required and section 173 states about circumstances when penalty cannot be imposed under 171 and 172. It is actually an exception to the penal provisions. Let's see what it says. No penalty for failure to deduct or pay equalization levy or failure to furnish statements shall be imposable if the SSE proves to the satisfaction of AO that there was a reasonable cause for the set failure. That means if there is a reasonable cause for the default made by the SSE under section 172 and 170, sorry, 171 and 172, then 173 as per the provisions of 173, no penalty. If there is a reasonable cause, suppose the SSE failed to furnish the statement required and there is a reasonable cause, then no penalty. This is what section 173 states about. Again, further, no order imposing a penalty under this chapter shall be made unless the SSE has been given a reasonable opportunity of being heard. That means suppose AO has plans to invoke the penal provisions, then he has to serve an opportunity of being heard to the SSE before invoking the penal provisions. No order, imp no, no order imposing a penalty under this chapter shall be made unless the SSE has been given a reasonable opportunity of being heard this is what 173 states about okay moving forward appeal to commissioner of income tax appeals we have already discussed income tax appeals in your assessment procedure area it is similar to that if an SSE agreed by any order imposing penalty under this chapter may appeal to the commissioner of income tax within 30 days from the date of receipt of the order of assessing officer if the SSE is a kind of if the SSE is agreed by any order then he has the right to go for appeal with CITA Commissioner of Income Tax appeals within 30 days of receipt of order and it shall be accompanied by a fees of thousand rupees and the fees for filing the appeal is thousand rupees and the provisions relating to appeals are in line with that of the Income Tax Act 1961 in the appeal area 246 we have already discussed what all are the provisions or what all are the conditions or what all are the guidelines at the time of appeal same same provisions same instruction same rules okay moving forward section 175 appeal to appellate tribunal after cita we have the right to go to itad that means appellate tribunal an ssc agreed by an order made by the commissioner of income tax appeals under the section 174 may appeal to the appellate tribunal against such order if an SSE is not satisfied with the final result of this appeal that means CIT appeal CIT appeals if an SSE is still not satisfied with the CITA appeals then he has the right to go for appeal in appellate tribunal that is what this section states about again if the commissioner of income tax may if objects to any order passed by the Commissioner of Income Tax Appeals under Section 174, direct the AO to file an appeal to the Appellate Tribunal. Again, the authority has the right to file an appeal. Suppose if the authority is not satisfied with the order given by CITA, if the assessing officer is not satisfied by the order or the result or the order by the CITA, then obviously the assessing officer with the permission of Commissioner of Income Tax can file an appeal to the appellate tribunal okay this is what 175 states about again the rules guidelines everything 
is as same as the normal income tax provisions. That means the rules of appeal, the additional documents under appeal, everything is similar to that of the normal income tax provision. Again, moving forward, an appeal shall be filed within 60 days from the date on which the order sought to be appealed against is received by the SSE or by the Commissioner of Income Tax as the case may be. The time, the due date for filing the appeals is 60 days from the date on which the order of appeal or the order sought to be appealed against is received by the SSE or Commissioner. Then again, in the case of an appeal filed by an SSC, it shall be accompanied by a fees of 1000 rupees. CITA and Appellate Tribunal, the fees is rupees 1000. The fees is similar, that is rupees 1000. Moving forward, punishment for false statement under section 176. Let's see, if a person makes a false statement in any verification under this chapter, or delivers an account or statement which is false and which he knows or believes to be false or does not believe to be true. That means if a person, it simply means if a person furnishes a, a false statement, what happens? He shall be punishable with an imprisonment for a term which may extend to three years. So maximum imprisonment is three years. Furnishing a false statement will attract a maximum imprisonment of three years. Again, the offence punishable above shall be deemed to be non-cognizable. Non-cognizable means bailable. It is a bailable offence. Okay, obviously it is a bailable offence, but the maximum punishment may be three years or the maximum imprisonment can be three years. Again, no prosecution shall be instituted against any person for any offence except with the previous sanction of Chief Commissioner of Income Tax. For initiating prosecution, the AO or the Commissioner has to get consent from the Chief Commissioner of Income Tax. This is what section 177 states about. 176 speaks about the punishment for filing false statement and 177 speaks about the consent that should be obtained from the chief commissioner of income tax before initiating prosecution okay moving forward constitutional provisions in the income tax act 1961 due to the equalization levy or due to the introduction of equalization levy in the finance act 2016 what all are the constitutional provisions or or what all are the provision that is newly introduced in the income tax act point number one section 10 subsection 50 Section 10, you know, it is an exemption section or it is sections of exemptions. Let's see, Section 10, subsection 50 provides to exempt an income arising from providing any specified service on or after the date on which the provisions of Chapter 8 of the Finance Act 2016 comes into enforce and chargeable to equalization levy under the chapter. That means any income which is levyable or which is charged to equalization levy is totally exempted under Section 10, subsection 50 income is already charged to equalization levy then there is no point or it is then that particular income is totally exempted again cannot be charged to tax as per section 10 subsection 50 simple section already we have charged already the authority have charged equalization levy then again they have no right to charge or treat that particular amount as income as per the provisions of 10 subsection 50 because that income is totally exempted provided it is chargeable to equalization levy that's the point moving forward in order to ensure compliance with the provisions of this chapter section 40 a i b provides that if on any consideration equalization levy is deductible and such levy has not been deducted or after deduction it has not been paid to the credit of government on or before the due date under section 139 subsection 1 then such expenses incurred by the SSE towards consideration for specified service shall not be allowed as a deduction. It is similar to our 40A1A or 40A1. What it says, in case TDS is not deducted on a particular expenditure 
or TDS is actually deducted and it is not paid to the credit of the government, then that particular expenditure, if it is in relation to a non-resident, is fully disallowed. 100% disallowance we have already discussed in the normal provisions of income tax. Similar to that, if a payment which is actually levyable to equalization levy has not been deducted or actually deducted but not to not paid to the credit of central government in such a situation that amount or that expenses shall be disallowed as per the provisions of section 40a 1b this is what 40a 1b states about however where in respect of such consideration if the equalization levy has been deducted in any subsequent year or has been paid such amount shall be allowed as a deduction in computing the income of the previous year in which such levy has been paid what it says on subsequent payment on subsequent payment it is allowed as a deduction just as similar to the tedious uh, disallowance okay moving forward we will do a simple illustration to understand the concept of the entire equalization levy okay yes ABC Limited, an Indian company, is carrying on the business of manufacture and sale of teakwood. Teakwood furniture, sorry, under the brand name Purewood. In order to expand its overseas sales or exports, it launched a massive advertisement campaign of its products. For the purpose of online advertisement, again, for the purpose of online advertisement, it utilized the services of PQR INC a london based company so online advertisement as you know is obviously a specified service the specified service is actually received from a company which is non resident that means pqr inc which is based on london now during the previous year 2018 2019 abc limited paid 5 lakh to pqr that means the amount of consideration paid to pqr is 5 lakh for such services discuss the tax implications or tedious implications of such payment and receipt in the hands of abc limited and pqr inc respectively if part number one pqr inc has no permanent establishment in india if there is no permanent establishment for that particular non-resident who is receiving consideration for providing specified services then obviously you know the answer what is the answer that particular consideration is levyable for equalization levy or it is chargeable as per the provisions of section 165 of finance act 2016 and the part two of the question pqr inc has a permanent establishment in india and the services is effectively connected to the permanent establishment in india then what happens let's go through the answer this is actually where pqr inc has no permanent establishment in india what happens if PQR has no permanent establishment. As you know, in the present case, equalization levy at the rate 6% is chargeable on the amount of consideration that is on 5 lakh. That particular 5 lakh is chargeable at the rate 6 percentage equalization levy. There is no surcharge, no cess. 6 percentage equalization levy. And the amount is 30,000. Okay, why it is chargeable to equalization levy? Because it is one of the advertisement services, one of the specified services and it is actually provided by a non-resident who does not have a PE to a resident. That's why it is levyable to equalization levy. Again, and the question also states about tedious implications. Okay, discuss the tax implications or tedious implications. Okay, so tell me, in the first situation, is there any requirement of tedious? Because we have to deduct that equalization levy itself is a kind of a tedious, right? We have to deduct, the payer has to deduct the equalization levy and pay the balance amount to the non-resident, the London party here. And the equalization levy credited or deducted has to be paid to the credit of the central government before 7th of next month. Okay, and one more point. If the payment is not given to the credit of central government or if there is a failure in deducting the equalization levy, then as per section 40 AIB, 100% of the amount paid while computing business income is treated as a disallowance. This actually, this advertisement is an expenditure for our teak wood, pure wood, ABC limited, right? For that Indian company, the advertisement is an expenditure. And while paying the consideration amount to the non-resident, he have to deduct the equalization levy. If you don't, what happens? As per 40 AIB, 
hundred percent disturbance. That's it. Again, we'll move on to the situation number two, where P Q R I N C has a permanent establishment in India, and service is effectively connected to the permanent establishment in India. Suppose what if happens if that particular entity has a permanent establishment? The answer is very obvious. It is not chargeable to equalization levy. So all the profits which are attributable to that permanent establishment will be obviously taxed according to the relevant articles of double taxation avoidance agreement. This is an expert answer. Okay, what the institute answer states is like has a permanent establishment in India and have services effectively connected to the permanent establishment in India. Therefore, ABC Limited is not required to deduct equalization levy on 5 lakhs being an amount paid towards online advertisement services to PQR. The question only states about it is no chargeable to equalization levy. This answer does not speak about what is the tax impact. So let me tell you what is the tax impact. Yeah. If that particular entity have a permanent establishment in India, then what happens? All the incomes which are attributable to that particular permanent establishment will be taxable in India according to the relevant provisions of DTAA because this company is situated in London and government of India have signed a double taxation avoidance agreement with UK. So we have to refer the DTAA provisions as well. Yes, while moving forward, however, Tax has to be deducted by the ABC Limited at the rate in force under section 195. If you are paying any amount under section 195 or sorry, if you are paying any amount to a non-resident, TDS is required to be deducted under section 195. If you don't deduct TDS under 195, what happens? 40A1, 100% disallowance will comes to picture. Okay. So, thank you. Subscribe to LearnCab and hit the bell icon to get notified.